another mini show we're featuring the third installment of the literary prose and poetry corner larry cos one and lorraine dimitrovic return this month to share more of their creative works depicting the serious as well as hilarious sides of life you can also check in to the ultimate movies page silence to new releases on facebook to listen to mike pearl's frequently posted musical choices from youtube First up is Larry Cosawan, and we say welcome back to his segment, Larry's Literally Little Literary Labyrinth. Larry Cosawan first joined us in 2016 with a couple of prose poems, and today he reads two recent works, The Pillar Candle and Roads to Peace with Poems. He'll also share a story about a squirrel written last month for an online creative writing course. The Pillared Candle was inspired by his octogenarian mom, Nancy, who is still a beautiful bright light in his world. In 2016, Larry wrote The Roads to Peace in response to a challenge by Jeevan Bhagwat of the Scarborough Poets of the two themes of roads and peace. Now retired, Larry is pursuing his hobbies and is dedicated to improving the quality of his daily life. He enjoys creative writing in many forms, with friends, in local groups, for fun and feedback. Larry now joins us for his reading. The Pillar Candle by Larry Kosowan Oh, high on a wooden shelf, an old familiar candle with cascade layers of wax dripped down its sides like strings of pearly beads curls inward at the top, toward the ashen wick, bored deep into its core. Once smooth and tall and straight, it has burned down from quiet nights alight, yet lit burns brightly still, a clear, pure flame which has not changed through all the years. Peter and the Squirrels by Larry Kosowan. Peter, a retired aeronautical engineer, sits at the piano keyboard in the living room with his wrists poised. He is gazing out the window. A black squirrel crouches under the bird feeder, its fluffy tail against the back of its neck. It picks up seeds with curled claws and nibbles. The squirrel chases a rival, then races down the fence line, up a tree, and along a telephone wire to disappear in the evergreens. The man raises his fingers to practice a song, Birds in the Garden, for his two-year-old granddaughter. The squirrel reappears in the living room window. Too close. The musical ideas fly from his head. His tongue clicks and his knees push back the piano bench, scraping the hardwood floor. The furry creature snaps to look, one paw raised to its chest, and they lock eyes. The man stomps to the porch, kicks the screen door, and stands glaring on the frosty deck with his knuckles on his hips. The cedar hedge quivers as the squirrel rustles in the branches. Peter lifts his hands to smack them together, but as the sound of a brick saw careens through the backyards, he folds his arms, watches the silent birds and squirrels rummaging for treats, and he expels a cloudy breath. Crunching closer along the snow-powdered planks, he draws a peanut from the pocket of his corduroy jacket. He tosses it down the steps. Two squirrels tussle. One scrambles up the fence victorious with a bulging cheek. High above, an energetic cardinal sings from the treetop. Peter nods. The peanut feeder is empty. He drops a fistful into the squirrel-resistant metal cylinder and goes inside to bird watch. The red bird interrupts its song to swoop to the perch. It snatches a nut in its beak. As it ascends again to the treetop, 
The engineer's eyes follow the cardinal's wings through each uplift, downbeat, and tilt. The bird watcher smiles and tucks himself in at the piano. He frolics over boogie-woogie chords and the high, fast melody. He laughs, remembering two-year-old Cordobilla last week. She stands with her hand on the window ledge. Grandpa, the birds are singing. Can you see the squirrels? Do squirrels sing? No, they act like circus clowns. Sometimes they break things, and then Grandpa chases them away. The musician's index finger plays an aggressive downward run, which sounds like a squirrel. He sees a young black squirrel tasting the flower buds of the wisteria vine and spitting them out. He hammers several dissonant chords. The black fur ball then leaps onto the roof of the garage and tastes a shingle. Enough! He storms outside, yelling at the young squirrel, and slaps his palms together in a brief round, not of applause, but reproof. The wild animal retreats, and Peter steps into the kitchen to pour a cup of Earl Grey tea. He soothes himself, playing the farewell waltz. Outside, the branches of the tall evergreens are shifting in the wind. Roads to Peace with Poems by Larry Cosselon He walks from the office over the cold hard ground, looking west toward Jesus, still kneeling to ask about the cup, where once a vandal had carefully placed a football in his stone arms. Hair whipping around damp eyes, he steps onto the lawn, with cold fingers in tight pockets to find Steed's resting place, the bronze plaque turned green beneath the crusted snow. Lightly lifting his boots above the silent sleepers, oblivious with their brief poems, together forever, in God's loving arms, rest in peace. He stops and stands alone, shivering in the straight wind. Mitrovic reads her saga, That Damn Accordion, which looks back on her sometimes challenging and sometimes funny experiences with her greatest nemesis, the accordion. As a young teen, she reveals that she never really wanted to learn how to play the accordion, but took lessons to please her family. Her memories are often humorous and vivid and, of course, a little exaggerated, and that damn accordion truly seemed to take on a life of its own. The story is copyright 2002, 2003, 2015, and 2017. L. Crystal Dimitrovic. Here now is Lorraine reading That Damn Accordion. That Damn Accordion, an Apologia for Accordion Haters, or a quite true story with a measure of measured exaggeration for the benefit of those who need to laugh at musical instruments that honk, or musical instruments invented on other planets by L. Crystal Dimitrovic, otherwise known as me, Lorraine. I wonder how much is in here, I asked, listening to the promising jingle as I shook my baby blue gremlin coin bank. The bugged out eyes were unsympathetic, the scared stiff hairdo was downright unfashionable, and its gaping slit of a mouth was mute. The sign on the bulbous stomach instructed me to put your money where my mouth is, but my intent was to take out all my life savings. Beating out a rhythm as I shook the little monster, I fathomed a hopeful guess. At least five bucks. Here goes. I yanked out the round rubber stopper and showered my bedspread with a rainbow of copper and silver. It took a little over fifteen minutes to roll up seven dollars and fifty cents worth into wrappers. It helped that some of the nickels had edges, with forty-three cents and pennies left over as a bonus. Unfortunately, seven dollars and ninety-three cents could hardly be enough for the package deal I was thinking about that of selling my soul to the devil in exchange for his reversing time and keeping the invention of the accordion to himself. You see, I was at an impasse. Like any child who didn't want to grow up and face life's greatest mysteries maturely, I knew I would never really learn to proficiently play a musical instrument that I disliked 
or would come to dislike, for any reason. And anyway, to me, it has always been a mystery why anyone the right side of sane would ever want to play the accordion. I slowly dripped the loose pennies back into the bank and looked about my room for a perfect hiding place for the rolls of nickels. Under the mattress was too obvious, and so was the closet. Then I thought of the second thing I hated most in the world, crinolines. The same one fit you at six years old or twelve, and the one I detested above all the others was a scratchy white umbrella instrument of torture with a hoop wire hem that made me itch even when it was nowhere near my skin. I hated that one the most because it was an Olympic event to try and keep my skirt from swooping up like a ring of Saturn whenever I sat down. I knew I would never wear it to play the accordion or any other instrument for that matter. Once out of the drawer, I bent the wired hem of the crinoline in half and pulled some of the mesh through to create a pocket. I plunked in all the rolls of nickels and pennies. The leftover sheet of mesh was easy to tear down the middle, and I tied both sides together after wrapping it once around the pocket. The furnace floor vent in my room lifted off easily enough, and I slid the butterfly net-like contraption down until I could no longer see the end. Safe, I sighed, thinking of my brother, who I knew loved scrounging through my drawers. I released my fingers from the tip of the half-moon length of wire and then heard roll, clunk, bang, high-pitched scrape, clunk, roll, and bang, bang, clunk. Somewhere within its innards, our furnace was a little richer. I decided I wouldn't wonder about the possibility of the wrappers catching fire until winter arrived, because the accordion problem was momentarily taking up all my worry time. It wasn't long after my tenth birthday that I realized children deserved the right to retain a lawyer in situations of physical and mental abuse. Certainly, ethnic force-feeding and the threat of abandonment, if one did not wish to play a musical instrument not of their own choosing, qualified as grounds for. The subject of holy accordions came up during a long-ago discussion around a dinner table heaping with sarma, better known as cabbage rolls, and other ethnic meals like polenta, a cornmeal and bean mixture which could have been used to cement bricks together. I was born in Canada, yes, but smack in the culinary middle of Europe where every entree was fat-rich, taste-heavy, nutrition lean, and guaranteed to make my grandparents of Balkan descent gibber Slavonic rhapsodies if I dared risk my life and take a second helping. That night, however, the gold teeth in their mouths gleamed rapturously as I rolled the sarma around like a log in my own, trying to remove its inedible part. The plots of the unseen wicked were unfolding, and the noose about my creative future was tightening. Of course, she must play the accordion, was their trumpet voluntary, in hopes that a descendant of theirs would gamble forth in musica, guaranteed to bring back folktale and polka talk about the old country. Unfortunately, their enthusiasm alone was reason enough for my parents to set up that first appointment, and I trembled with foreboding that I would lack the hand-eye coordination required to make such an instrument pip and squeak. At ten years of age, what exactly did I know about the secret society of accordions? I studied the music school picture I'd been given by my parents. It was half the size of the mustachioed gentleman wearing embroidered leather shorts. The embroidery didn't bother me, as grandmother, better known as Babitza, embroidered all the family pillowcases, whether they were adorned with intricate stitchery already or not. It was that the man was wearing a hat stuck with a feather, and above him was a flock of birds, eyeing him menacingly as he embraced the dark grey honk in a box. Would I be counted as the first recorded attack in history by Canada geese if I too played the accordion out of doors during migrating or mating seasons? My only comforting thought then was that I would treat the technologically regressed alien as though it were an ersatz uneducated third cousin to the harp. Yet, one could never totally deny it wasn't indeed a mutant musically inclined platypus minus the fur, as no other species of keyboard instrument had airy reeds instead of plucky strings. I finally concluded that it was in a class all by itself. If it had never been invented, I wondered, what might scientists determine about it if it had one day fallen out of the sky instead? All the musing, of course, was a device for self-preservation, as I considered any future meeting with the thing a reservation for eye-to-eye -eye contact on an ill harmony battlefield. On the soon-arrived day, admittedly by now a little curious to get acquainted with the new X-factor in my life, I ran up hilly Southwood Drive, then past the crowded squash of tiny storefronts on Kingston Road, raced down concrete stairs to a sunken door, and infiltrated an unfamiliar macrocosm. Other children were waiting cheerfully, each brandishing an instrument that had been polished to the point of effulgence, a violin, a guitar, a clarinet. I drummed my fingers on my knees in trepidation. Not one of them was balancing an accordion on their knees or trying to hide it in its cage behind a chair. 
Was I the only student enrolled for the fine art of squeeze box playing? It didn't look good. My name was called. Entering the correct tutorial room, number one, I came face to face with the most perfidious looking woman I'd ever seen. She was dressed all in black, stockings, shoes, everything. Her hair was fashioned like a psycho spinster's, with a hairspray lacquered bun which would certainly have scared off potential suitors and tempt naive children to press on it as though it were a panic button. Her lipstick, dried and compressed into the vertical lines of her grub-worm plump mouth, was the dark streaked crimson of tulips, stabbed by a thunderstorm. Her eyes were, well, a little later they will be spoken of at length. The ears were pixie-ish, pointed and curled like Mickey Rooney's in the 1935 film A Midsummer's Night Dream. Yes, most certainly one of Nick's minions, I thought, and my fate was sealed. Was there any way of escape? Bars strapped the windows. With a silent gulp and the feeling I was staining my underarms, as they were running like Niagara Falls, I looked around surreptitiously to see if the walls were soundproofed. Oh, God, they were. Years later, I would come to realize the walls had been constructed of acoustic tiles. Then it spoke. Her name, she said, was Mrs. B., and as it turned out, she was from a neighboring Balkan country to my grandparents. From here on in, she shall be irreverently referred to as Mrs. Bullhit. My instincts began to serve me well. Immediately I dreaded the notion of lessons continuing after sundown. My toes began to twitch a knot in my shiny black oxfords, screaming to depart the haunted floor. That condition was always the first stage of healthy paranoia for me, alerting me to the necessity of scramming from a crime scene in which I may find myself the unwitting victim. I could well justify my anxiety, as my paternal grandparents believed in vampires. In the early 1900s, in the wilds of Serbia, I was told, many a dead drunk husband returning home too late after a too long night in the forest, parting with combustive plum brandy, Shlivovets, and a loose petticoat, not belonging to the wife, would wake up deader than he had been drunk, with garlic stuffed in his mouth and his lips blood red, from the loose petticoat's lipstick, with the customary stake, or barn rake handle, through the heart. For me, it was easier to believe the wives believed their husbands were vampires, who had coincidentally sought out the village vamps. I didn't wonder that some travel books well into the 1980s warned single women to never travel alone in the then Yugoslavia, and especially not in the countryside. While I wanted to laugh at the notion that my accordion teacher might be a species of vampire, I now found myself intensely studying her bicuspids. Here, for you! Bull hit pointed to the floor, to an open battered case containing the little red loner accordion. You keep for six weeks, then buy new one if good. For the next six weeks, she grunted and barked out commands through the introductory lessons, and I learned the mandatory scales and simple songs. I was always careful to never hold eye contact for very long, for if I did, I feared those uninviting frosty black holes, so sunless and imploded upon themselves, like lodestones, would magnetically draw me into her parallel universe composed solely of contorted, nightmarish, black marble and ivory staircases that had been made to be climbed endlessly, so endlessly, all the while the beer barrel polka was unwinding in miners and plunking in a dirge, just for me. I couldn't look anywhere upon the rest of her person for very long either. As the weeks wore on, she seemed to transform for the worse before my eyes, and no one else seemed to take notice. Her lipstick grew darker, as though she'd been drinking stronger poisons, her smile becoming increasingly a midnight blue demonic gash. Her hoof-thick nails appeared to have been rough-honed by a blacksmith's rasp. Appearance aside, her methods were graduating up the scale in sadism. Her guttural, tooth-spitting instruction was now accompanied by verbal insults to my intelligence and threats to my body parts. I cringed when the pointer she used to tap out the beat always came too close to my fingers as I turned pages. One day, holding back tears, playing the merry widow, just as she was about to crack my angry white knuckles on the bass buttons for hitting the F instead of the G, I swore to the best of my ability at her. You horrible, dirty, mean, creep-faced plop of bull- Note that the last word I said in the sentence was actually spelled slightly differently. Then I gasped, realizing what I had said and done. I had sealed my fate. Would I live until the next sunrise? There was a padded, surreal silence for about fifteen seconds. Her eyes then began to boil. I closed my own, but I couldn't help smiling. In accordion boxing matches, I had just won the first round with a grand bellows. As I opened my eyes, she connected. Her full, flat, evil, hot palm forced itself with delight upon my cheek. 
I am phoning your parents as soon as lesson is done. You are no good, you very bad girl, she shrieked. And all this time, I was still certain she was holding back her true disposition, suspecting that she would remain tolerably sadistic only until I could sign a longer and more tormenting contract, which would of course require that my family buy a new and accordingly very expensive accordion from her music academy. A strange serenity haloed the dinner table that evening, but I could read all their thoughts. I knew they knew about the afternoon, having heard the phone ring just as supper was being arranged on the table and I knew that it was the phone call from Bullhead, as my mother called for my father to get on the extension in the basement. Above me, a mental guillotine blade was ready to descend upon my degenerate conscience, but I wouldn't let it drop. I was not sorry for showing disrespect to my music teacher by insulting her, only sorry that my family had to find out. I made sure, however, to appear excruciatingly sorrowful to all concerned, as I did desire to enjoy a normal lifespan. The way of the world demanded I be punished. Then suddenly, inwardly, I smiled and sighed with relief. When my dad was at his most mad, my brother and I both knew we wouldn't get the belt or be spanked by hand, as we knew he feared he might injure either one of us if he disciplined us physically. And this was one of those times I could tell I would not be punished. So, without knowing what else to do, I bided my reprieve the whole long, silent dinner, rolling peas in my spoon until they were seasick, gumming mashed potatoes into my cheeks, flattening strings of ham with my fork to my plate. I waited for some fashion of curtains of judgment to swaddle me. The silence became almost unendurable. I tried to catch the eye of my grandmother, but she avoided my attempts and kept straightening a small doily she'd crocheted beneath the gaudy hen and turkey salt and pepper shakers. Grandfather kept sniffing loudly through his gray hair sprouting nostrils. Mother kept holding her breath. They were all mad, not to mention disappointed in me. Well, all except my brother, who kept holding his cheeks flat in against his face to keep from laughing out loud. They all kept doing something to keep from talking about the way I had disgraced the family. No one ate dessert. In the middle of the table, the chocolate cake sat uncut and lonely, warming to room temperature as vanilla ice cream icebergged in a bowl beside it and lost its chill in a slowly enlarging velvet sea. Finally, my father spoke. I knew he had taken mandolin lessons as a child and had hated it. His eyes, still vexed into braids from the phone call, betrayed no sympathy. Next time you will die, understand, was all he said with the authority of Taurus Bulba. I understood. For the next few weeks, during the bouts with Mrs. Bullhead, I clenched my teeth to prevent a repeat performance on my part. Whenever she wrapped my knuckles, I would cross my eyes and make Harpo Marks faces at her when she had her face turned away. And not once did I speak disrespectfully to her. I was extremely proud of myself, and I had succeeded in remaining sane while learning every nuance to the meaning of the term self-control. Shortly before the day to sign my soul to pianist perdition arrived, my parents hesitantly asked, You do like the accordion and enjoy taking lessons, don't you? You haven't said a word about it at all lately. It appeared they had completely forgotten the talk-back incident. Was my inheritance hinging on my answer? We were at the groaning board of a dinner table again. My grandparents looked at me with expectant wide smiles. That night we were having bacalar, a smoke-dried salt cod dish reconstituted and boiled until it flaked and tasted like stale oatmeal, only rescued by heaping it with epic divides of garlic. One did not reek for hours, but for days. Sen Sen only helped if you engulfed enough to put you into suspended animation. I carefully raised a mounded fork of the blanched vampire-killing fodder to my trembling lips and thought to myself, I can't say that I hate accordion and wished the teacher would slink back into the conflagration she had emerged from. I also considered the bounty of chocolate bars and bags of potato chips, most often coffee crisp or sweet Marie and Frito Lays that Babitza pulled from her handbag on their visits when I was, as she liked to call me, a good accordion-playing girl. If I truthfully admitted my dislike of the corrugated red anathema, Grandpa would likely never talk to me about Russian politics again either. I envisioned my parents disowning pitiable, untalented me and ornamenting my brother's hockey-helmeted head with 24-karat gold laurel leaf. In our family, it was long tradition that only one child should be crowned God and saving grace. Hadn't my parents taken my brother during his hockey tournament finals in Quebec to see the Bon Homme? Yet, they had never come to any of my musical or other recitals or plays at school, and had never shed a solitary, sympathetic tear for me, even during winter knowing full well what I carried week in and out up an icy hill. I looked at my family resignedly, sighed out my defeat. 
I had only one chance to win their lifelong respect and affection. As well, I couldn't risk disappointing my grandparents and losing the perks that came along with keeping them happy. I love accordion, I fibbed. It was a lie I'd regret uttering for two years, and my God, nothing is more like eternity to a child than two whole years. So, within a week, it arrived. The new accordion must have been related one way or the other to Mrs. Bullhead, with its gnashing keyboard teeth and its overall cold-blooded appearance. Black and white with chrome, it resembled a first cousin to a tuxedoed vampire whose well-dressed manners concealed its true intentions. I knew I was in mortal danger. Feeling faint, I quickly closed the lid of its imitation blue crocodile coffin, locked the latch, and stood next to it. It came up to the top of my thigh. I tried picking the case up by the handle and winced. Fully grown accordions were not good sport. Now I really wanted to cry. The next day was worse. With my parents working and blithe grandparents nowhere to be found, no one would help me up to lessons with the larger accordion. I would endure two years of macabre sessions, feeling like a stranger journeying toward an even stranger land. Up that hill I trudged faithfully, feeling my left arm stretch as I hauled the equivalent weight of an extinct dinosaur, cowering under Mrs. Bullhit's threatening snarls of, Don't be so stupid! I bit back tears when she compressed the fingers of my right hand on the keyboard whenever I played a wrong note. Being disrespectful is one thing I'd learned not to indulge in, if you remember but enjoying secret revenge was a completely different horse altogether. What joy, what deserved bliss I experienced, skipping home after every lesson down Mount Everest. I'd push that bloody accordion so vengefully it would pitch end on end and bang loudly on the pavement ahead of me. One time I launched it so hard it screeched and scraped as a rolling square projectile out of control. Down the hill it careened like a dervishing torpedo scraping bottom. Please explode, I begged as I ran panting after it. I knew I'd be doing the universe a favor if I could exterminate it. I truly hoped I had killed it. But by the time I had reached the bottom of the street to see if it was having death throes, I knew God wasn't smiling on me that day. I spat out my gum despondently. I opened the case with great trepidation, hoping the thing's ivory teeth had fallen out and its reedy guts had shredded into a linen and plastic coleslaw. But no, that damn Weasel McCullough was immortal. They must have guardian angels, I sheeshed. It now became all-out war. I can't recall how many times and ways I tried to execute it. I even once considered lugging it to Toronto City Hall to the observation deck, but figured I wouldn't have the muscle to lift it high enough to heave it over and down. The case eventually became so battle-scarred, I worried my parents would figure out my obsessive atrocities carried out against it, but as usual, they were oblivious. The last lesson finally took place the first week I entered junior high and discovered part of the curriculum was a compendium of music classes, which trained the young and impressionable on every musical instrument imaginable, except the accordion. Official academic assessment had determined I'd be able to learn a classical instrument, and I chose the cello first. But after three months, I became hopelessly attracted to the violin. I figured I even had an advantage with my extra-long left bowing arm, thanks to what I'd carried around for 24 months. Eventually, I worked my way up to second violin. Memories of the boxed terror slowly faded like the whiny exhale of downtime notes from a bagpipe. Having had to keep the accordion as it had been paid for, I stashed it at the back of my bedroom closet behind 16 magazines, from which every picture of Mark Lindsay of Paul Revere and the Raiders had been removed and tacked on my walls. My strings class teacher, Mr. C, was as much a stretch for Mrs. Bullhead, and he lived across the street. My mother and he once backed out of our driveways at the same moment. I remember her later frantically explaining to the insurance company how both cars could have suffered rear-end damage only. But that's another story. Nightmares about Mrs. Bull hit ceased, but I did go on to reluctantly play the Blue Danube and other ethnic wedding favorites for years, much to the delight of my old country grandparents. Now our granddaughter plays two musical instruments, and the violin especially well, was their incessant report to anyone with ears. Until the day they died, I'm certain they thought I was still enthralled with that damn accordion. I never had the heart to tell them that I thought such instruments could be put to better use as mega-sized block heaters or opera-caliber hog collars. So it was meant to be. Sweet, gentle strains of the violin, not the honk of reeds and bellows, would be my road toward appreciating classical music. I even eventually became the proud owner of a fiddle years after picking one up in junior high. And revenge was very sweet indeed. One day when I was in my thirties, that old monster accordion came in handy. I used it most eagerly as a trade-in for the violin I planned to one day pass on to my son. 
Or perhaps I should say, I'll only pass it on if he honestly wants to play it. Maybe I should even wait to see if he'll beg me for it. Even so, would it hurt to teach him a little scale or two in the meantime? Everything is fine with the world because I don't think they even make accordions anymore, unless they special order for persons by the name of Walter. They must have gone the same way as the Iron Maiden, or I hope they have, because I never met an accordion I liked, and I hope that my son never will either. I'm just getting back into my books here and just going to try out a few little notes here. Drink to me only with thine eyes. <laughs> Easier ones that I used to play here. Get the Mary Widow Waltz here. Let's see now. Now there's one called the Echo Waltz, which I thought was pretty good too. All right, try this guy out here. See you then.